spoiler alert, that's a lot of reviews on YouTube is overly positive, overly glitzy, glammy sort of reviews that don't really mention any negatives. And they present you with an affiliate link. They get five to 10% of the sale, five to 10% of a sale of a 400 to $500 item is a lot of money. Hello, and welcome back to the Guitar Craft and Other Stuff podcast. I'm your host, Andre Flood. Today's episode features Ricky Young of the fantastic YouTube channel, Audio Haze. I will link it below. You definitely want to check him out because he is one of the best people at telling stories when it comes to production. And he's also one of the best mic reviewers on the platform. And I actually wanted to talk to him because I was really interested in how he makes his videos and his plans for the future. But we ended up spending most of the time just talking about our own plans for YouTube, the ethics of reviews, all of the behind the scenes information about what YouTubers get paid, my plans for making a living on YouTube. And we both live in the New York City, New Jersey area. So we also spent a lot of time talking about the cost of living and the struggles of being in this part of the world. So if that type of topic interests you, I think you'll really enjoy today's episode. Ricky, right, where do we start? Yeah. Why don't you tell us about your, your musical background, uh, the whole, the, the whole story, uh, in a couple of minutes. <laughs> totally. Um, so for me, it's kind of a weird background for a YouTube channel because I started this YouTube channel as a school project at Berkeley, um, as a graduate thesis, which is a little strange, um, because, you know, we had this whole year where we basically had to start in September and end in July. Most people did an EP or an album or some kind of elaborate music video concept. The business majors, a lot of them made labels. I made a YouTube channel, <laughs> um, which kind of the goal was whenever I first started in music school, I, I really got um, worn down by the level of self-promotion you had to do. Um, and it, you know, everyone was always pushing their music. Everyone was always ironically on, on social media. And I, I just... I started like that and I kind of ended by saying I'd rather just make content that helped people. So I silently made a YouTube video, didn't tell anyone about it. Um, at first, I feel like all YouTubers just like don't talk about their YouTube channel because it's a little embarrassing when you start. Um, and yeah, so originally it was a lot of stuff about gear, obviously, but trying to use it in a musical context. Um, and none of these original videos were great, but that's what the, the goal was. Then eventually, kind of along the way, certain niches of content sort of took more than others. So um, I became more microphone related. And uh, throughout sort of ideating on a bunch of different video concepts, the channel became more about microphone reviews and how to use them within the context of a bedroom studio. So as you guys might see, I, I have a bed in the background. I'm, I'm, I'm working in an area that I think a lot of producers are, which is in a low budget setup and, and how to get the most out of it. So I've got a degree in music technology and production, but I still try and teach within the con context of, you know, the average home producer, because I think that's maybe a little bit of a disconnect between the stuff you see online and then you as a viewer is... A lot of times you're looking at this content and these creators have like this, this, this monument to amazing gear behind them, tens of thousand dollars worth of stuff. And you're like, well, I can't do that. I got a little Scarlet and an SM57. And so I, I, I try and relate to that kind of creator or, or to that kind of producer. That's the goal at least. Very cool. So what years were you at Berkeley? Just curious. Yeah. So I actually, um, important distinction i was at the berkeley campus in valencia spain so some people may not know this but valencia is one of like i think going on three or four campuses now so there's the one in boston there's the one in valencia i think there's one in like dubai now um and the one in valencia has a one-year accelerated degree where you're taking on more class loads you're doing uh basically Sorry, um, this is a noisy environment. You're taking on multiple class loads and then um, you're basically ending with a master's degree in one year. So I was there from 2020 
kind of the height of the pandemic to 2021. Oh, very cool. See, I wasn't aware of that master's program. Did you also do music in undergrad? So I came from a degree in architecture, actually, which is a weird jump. I know. Uh, so I went to my undergrad in uh, University of North Carolina at Charlotte for arts and architecture. Um, ironically, I applied to that school with only music. So I went into that program and everyone else that was doing the interviews out of all the like houses they designed or really beautiful art. And I came with like an acoustic guitar and I did a performance as my interview. Um, and then throughout my time in architecture, I just figured that wasn't for me um, and jumped back on the music train. Very cool. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're out of Brooklyn now, right? Correct. Are so you... you here? sirens or car noises it's brooklyn <laughs> are you originally from the northeast no um i was born in oklahoma actually i like to say i upgraded every time i moved because i went to, from tulsa oklahoma to chapel hill north carolina charlotte north carolina then i went to valencia for for berkeley and then i moved to new york awesome i'm also so i'm in jersey city new jersey which is very close to Brooklyn. Mm, right. And um, right on the other side of the Hudson. Exactly. And I work, I don't think I've ever even said where I worked, but it is public record. I work at CUNY, the McCulley campus, which is on the up. I don't remember where it is right now because I, I'm always virtual for the most part, uh, but it's mm. right around Central Park, around the 50s or so. And uh, yeah, so. Another reason why I was kind of attracted to your channel and why I, so for those who don't know, once you have a YouTube channel for the most part and you start in a specific niche, you pretty much don't watch those videos anymore. At, at least I don't, <laughs> you know, I haven't watched a guitar review in probably since I started my channel. Cause it's like, I'm always thinking about guitar reviews and guitar lessons. So I don't want to watch that anymore, but one thing I still do watch is microphone reviews and production stuff, you know, uh, lighting and cameras and all of that stuff. And one thing that, one thing that I really liked about Ricky's channel is that it's clear in his content that he has a day job outside of YouTube and that he's doing all of this as part of a normal life. And I think that sometimes people have the misunderstanding that, oh, if you have if you now average 3000 views or 4000 views on a, on a, on a, on your videos or if you get someone who sends you a microphone or a pedal every now and then you must be you're just set right you're just racking in all of the dough and now that you just make youtube videos once or twice a week and you're set but the second i started to get somewhere around that same area of 3 4000 views a video i realized oh i'm not even close <laughs> it is being <laughs> even a little bit sustainable yet <laughs> yeah yeah, it's um, it depends on a lot of factors, to be fair. I think um, you have to like figure out if, A, if you want to monetize your content and B, how. Because, you know, I think if you're really sly with how you kind of create around the 10K subscriber range or the 20K subscriber range, you, you can make a relatively livable income but it's a low income but it's livable depending on where you're living um but it's also like um there there's a certain level of like purity to doing this as a, a passion and and a, the very most maybe a side gig rather than a full-time job because you know you, you're not relying on it for all your income so you're pretty perspectives are more honest the videos that you make are uh, you know in theory more what you want to make rather than this pursuit of full monetization and, and and fully living off of the content so you know i i think there's a give and take as well but for sure uh this level of income at this level of kind of creative or uh, at this level of being a creator is very rarely livable especially in the Northeast and Brooklyn, Jersey city, doesn't oh, really possible. matter. <laughs> yeah. 
It's uh, it's horrible. And then like number one most expensive city as of 2022. It was up there in 2021, but I think as of 2022, New York bypassed like four cities and became the most expensive expensive city in the whole world, which is crazy. Yeah, for for those who don't know, and it's even more expensive in New York City, but I'm in Jersey City, which is essentially it's like seven minutes from New York City, and I'm in this city where everyone moves here instead of Manhattan because they can get things slightly cheaper, which means that people like myself who were born and raised here are slowly getting pushed out of the ability to live here. So for the rest of the country who's listening, a two bedroom apartment, two bedroom, one bath in a neighborhood that doesn't have multiple shootings a month, it's at least 3000 a month minimum, if you're lucky. And uh, if you go below 22, if you go below 2200 a month for a two bedroom, you're going to be in a very, very unsafe neighborhood. For me, I grew up here. I'm used to it. It doesn't really bother me. But that's that's the that's what it takes to try to survive in this area. And you have to pay for other things as well, like, you know, transportation, food, all of that stuff. And even a decent wage, right? 40,000 a year. If someone was making that in the rest of the country, it would be like, wow, that's, that's respectable. That's an average American citizen, even maybe even above average in, in many places. But in this area, that's like struggling to get by in terms of um, income. So uh, yeah, it's like, it really warps your perspective. Like, whenever I moved here, trying to find my first apartment, I was crazy shocked by all the prices as as you should be but when you move here your reference for what affordable anything is just completely shatters so like you, you see fifteen hundred dollars a month for a one bedroom not or, or a studio even um a tiny studio you know 10 foot by 12 foot or whatever and you're like oh that's a good deal you know or you see like six dollar cereal and you're like oh, that's not that bad <laughs> Um, but then you go to like anyone else in the other part of the country and you, like, every price that you hear is like, oh, that's insane. And um, uh, talking about your income comment, I think the general rule of thumb is whatever your income is in New York City, take like 20K off. And that's what it's the equivalent of in another city. So, you know, if you make 50K here, that's like living on 30K in another city just because of the cost of living. It's insane. Yeah, absolutely. So recently Ricky had a video and this is another YouTuber thing. I feel like either in December or January, we all kind of go, fuck, what did I do? I really fucked up last year. I need to, (laughs) I need to get things back on track. Like three other people doing videos like mine. I was like, oh, I'm glad I'm not alone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I did. I did mine too, of course. Um, and in his video, he talked a little bit about this idea of starting a YouTube channel and letting the algorithm kind of start to dictate the content in a way that you start to slowly get taken away from what you initially intended. And I'm, 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 it's, it's, it's complicated, right? Because it's not ever a negative feeling. If I do a guitar review and it gets 100,000 views, I'm not like, Oh my God, this is horrible. It's exciting. It's amazing. It's fun. You appreciate all of it. But I know me personally, I am number one always, even before I started the idea of being a performing musician, I always wanted to be a teacher. So I'm a guitar teacher, but the only thing that gets views on my channel for the most part is guitar reviews. And so I found a few ways here and there to like sneakily teach people stuff while talking about a guitar review. Right. And, uh, I'm, I'm getting better at it, but it's definitely different than what I intended. And I think Ricky had a similar experience, right? Totally. Yeah. So first off, you're an amazing teacher. I was just watching your video on equal temperament right before we jumped in this, like keep on making the stuff you're making because you're doing an amazing job. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. You know, like I'll go to somebody, and I will, will say my original mission for this channel, as I said at the beginning of this podcast, was 
I want to make music production content that helps people in rooms like this create awesome music. But if you look at the content I produce, you can take one look through the page and you'll go, oh, you're a microphone reviewer. You know, like that's the content that worked for the algorithm. Um, and like Andre said, it's never a bad feeling. You know, if you make a microphone review and you see all those little, for those who don't know, if you go on YouTube studio, you get this little ranking and it'll say the video that you just published um, is one out of 10. It's the number one best video of the last 10 videos you've done. And you see a bunch of little green arrows pointing up saying everything you're doing is right. So YouTube kind of hacks your psychology into thinking, this is what I need to do. I need to get that green arrow. I need to get one out of 10 every time. And in doing so, you will notice that the platform will drive you into a certain niche. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times in the music world, or, or maybe even just in general, in terms of kind of a more capitalist society, that will result in something kind of orbiting around something you can buy or, or a way to spend money. So, um, you know, for Andre, that's guitar reviews. For me, it's microphones. And suddenly you kind of have to like look back at what you've done and you have to say, well, my original intention was to teach about production. But, you know, the content, you know, maybe some of that's there, maybe 30 or 40 percent of what I'm doing is that. But it's all coming with this sort of like focus of a product highlight. And, and that comes with all kinds of, you know, weird sort of, you know, other stuff. Um, you know, you, for me personally, I have to like reflect and think about um, how much am I, you know, working for my subscribers or how much of this content is mostly just benefiting brands. Um, and, you know, it, it's a weird sort of thing because the content that performs is not always the content um, you wanted to produce. And the system that YouTube kind of has produced doesn't necessarily, at least in the short term, reward you for the content you want to produce. It mostly rewards you for the content that fits your niche, um, which you don't always have a say in crafting. Sometimes you do. And I would say you have a partial say, I think, in the niche you craft, but part of it is not your say, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, talking about things in the music industry in particular, you know, I, I play guitar, you play guitar. I'm pretty sure you also sing, right? No, no. Every vocal demo, I either get my roommate to sing or I invite singers from the community. Yeah, I, I might have imagined that because I've definitely seen you play guitar and I've seen you, your second channel audio hey sessions, but I haven't seen you sing there. But anyway, so right. I, either way, you're a guitarist, you're a musician. He has a nice Fender Strat in the background, and little three thirty-five. There's oh, a I can see that one Explorer right over there. Awesome, and it's tricky because the guitar is an instrument that has so many prodigies. Like the level of guitar playing in twenty twenty-three is so high for even unknown people that it's not even good enough to be amazing at guitar anymore. Like I'm not amazing at guitar, but there are people who are amazing at guitar, way more amazing than me. And I go through the channels and it's like five views, 10 views. This video has been up for a year and you can, you can go through dozens and dozens of great, amazing guitarists, great songwriting, great production, no views whatsoever. Same thing with guitar teachers. Uh, not as much. I find that guitar teachers who I believe are really good generally get the audience, but it's not what you would hope to see. And then, and I'm, I don't want to talk bad about anyone, but you go to some guitar reviewers who can barely play, but they have, you know, 300,000, 200,000 views per video easily. And it's just like what you said, it, it's not entirely up to you. If you can see people who are making consistent, good music, 
for years on end and get almost no views, but someone making gear reviews who doesn't have the technical pedigree or maybe even the production pedigree can get a thousand percent more views on it. Well, then it becomes quite clear that it's not just, you know, working hard at your niche and really buckling down, making a thousand bad. It's it's not just that there's something else that is kind of shaping uh, how we view, how we view things on YouTube. Yeah. The, the way I like to put it is when you're originally starting and you have no core audience, you have to fulfill a want of the person who's watching. So if you create craft this like amazing piece, whatever you've been playing guitar for 20 years and you craft this masterpiece, no one, when they don't know you wants that. Mm. So YouTube isn't going to recommend that. Whereas a gear review, you know, they're not there for you, at least not at first you're fulfilling the want of them, you know, wanting to know more information about something they're going to buy. And on top of that, you also have to think about as a small creator, if there's any small creators watching the advice I always give as a small creator is the only way you're going to get views is through the search algorithm. You know, the way I divide up sort of YouTube is algorithm plays or search algorithm plays. We all know what an algorithm looks like, you know, a video that goes viral, whatever you don't search for it. It shows up on your homepage, but search algorithm you have to think of like the keywords people use and then suddenly maybe you can get a little bit higher up. So for me, um, the first, first video I made that went big was about a microphone called the Rode NT1 and another one called the Rode NT1A. I put a combination of Rode NT1 versus Rode NT1A. And then I said something like, these microphones are very different, whatever. It's a very specific title. Rode NT1 versus Rode NT1A. That's also a high level of traffic for that title. Um, because when you think about it, lots of people want to compare those two. There's probably only 20, 30 videos on YouTube that have that same exact concept. And so you end up in the top of the search algorithm. So when you're growing as a creator, on one side, the strategy is play to something that fulfills a want but you know the double-edged coin to that is unless you've come onto this platform in order to fulfill that want it's probably not the content you want to make um so you know yin and yang there's a balance to it and then you know from there you have to figure out either is this somewhere you want to stay how am i going to put myself into this content a little bit more? How can I teach? Um, or how do I make some sort of pivot, which is um, getting into kind of the future of my channel and the video that Andre was referencing. Something I'm trying to figure out right now is, you know, I love making gear reviews and I love specifically how much it seems to help people with their production choices. But that's not like for me, Uh, everything I want to create. I can't just be kind of like part of this machine for buying things. Um, so figuring out how to pivot and get people interested in content that is a little bit more pure in its intentions is a, a mountain of a task. And I think it's the task that I think everyone is kind of getting at when they post these year end videos of everyone talking about what have I done the last year? That's the task to figure out how to do. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. So if you were constructing your your dream lifestyle in terms of, you know, your your work at your day job, whatever that is, and your YouTube stuff, are you someone who your ultimate goal is to one day be full time YouTube with music and reviews and all types of stuff? Or are you someone who is more interested in keeping it as a side hustle? I think, um, I think, um, I really want to eventually be able to make stuff full time. Um, that said, um, 
a lot has to, I think, change in order to like feel confident in what I'm making full time. I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think I would ever go full time as a reviewer. Um, Cause I think that would really corrupt my opinion as I was saying previously, because suddenly I'm really relying on this income, which incentivizes me to make positive reviews, which incentivizes me to leave affiliate links and get a percentage of the sale. And uh, spoiler alert, that's a lot of reviews on YouTube is overly positive, overly glitzy, glammy sort of reviews that don't really mention any negatives. And they present you with an affiliate link. They get five to 10% of the sale, five to 10 percent of a sale of a 400 to 500 dollar item is a lot of money um i don't think i would ever see myself wanting to be that um for a number of reasons i think it'd be a betrayal of the audience and i think it'd be a betrayal of what i want to create but i could see myself being a full-time content creator if i could make this sort of pivot towards um more creative stuff and more pure content if that makes sense yeah and that that whole thing about most reviews essentially just being i think you said this in your video more most views are essentially just reading of the the product description really and in a really nice in a really nice well put together way and i'm i don't want anyone to misunderstand this i can probably speak for ricky when i say that he agrees that's not something that doesn't take talent that takes real effort. It takes real work, knowing how to put it all together with the lighting and the camera and the recording and the pacing of the video. That that's a that's a real skill, right? Um, but <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> it's like I, I mean I'll, I'll tell a quick story. Um, I have a few videos on my channel, and I'm not, I'm not gonna plug them because I actually don't even like drawing attention to them. The only I keep them up on my channel now out of obligation because they're honest and you know I feel disingenuous taking down a bad video that is honest about something. So I have a few of these videos that are fairly negative, and I know for a fact those videos are hurting my ability my ability to make connections with brands in the future. And I'll sit there and think to myself, well, if I just take down these four or five videos and I only highlight the positive stuff, then all of a sudden I'm a lot more marketable. But something about that feels disingenuous, you know, and it's not a lie. If you only feature products that you enjoy and you enjoy them all, that's not lying. But it does it gets into this strange gray area where it's like, well, am I just promoting stuff or am I trying to educate consumers in this case about a guitar or about a microphone? And the other funny thing that happens when you have this flood of positive reviews about a product is that I'll, there's one guitar in particular that has a very strong, uh, a strong community of fans and lots of glowing positive YouTube reviews, I do a review where I carefully document all of the issues that I'm having with cameras and timestamps and video. It, it's, it's like for me to buy this guitar with my own money and then fake the review that's negative would be insane. But since there's so many positive reviews on this particular thing, all of a sudden the one negative you review looks like someone who is, I don't know, trying to be negative for attention, which is it's a strange reversal of roles because <laughs> there are a lot of positive reviews that are being positive for the attention, but the negative review that is being honest and upset because I paid with my own money, that somehow is becoming the fake, <laughs> the fake review, if that makes sense. It's very strange yeah. YouTube only situation. Yeah, it, it's, it is weird. And I also think a lot of people will come to reviews, not necessarily to see if they should buy it, but also just to like affirm their purchase. So if Absolutely. you're a little negative, sometimes people are like, well, no, it's great. Cause they, you know, they got the rose colored, colored glasses on about what they just bought, you know? 100%. Um, yeah. And you know, 
there have been like times brands have sent like bribes and stuff. You know, it's not all. It's not a. Uh, it's not always so straightforward as it seems with these reviews, which is something I'm like learning as I go. You know, like people will. Um, sometimes a brand will just send like another mic, and I didn't even ask for it. Just show up. I'll be like, you don't need to do a review. But here you go. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in in the content creation world in order to kind of influence brands and the way I or influence creators and, and the way I say it is to kind of like become this extension of the brand in some ways, affiliated right. but not affiliated. Which is, in my perspective, you should always be unaffiliated. Affiliated, and whenever whenever I first started, I was like really excited to work with a brand, um, because I'm like, oh, what? I'm like, it legitimized what I was doing. Um, but product, don't talk to me. Give me a couple months. Put the review out. You can have the mic back. Um. Just because I think it's more healthy that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the idea of free product, it really, it really isn't that. I think the fact that I live in such a high cost of living area helps me be a little bit more cynical with brands because a brand, like, like you said, there's a couple companies who will just say, Hey, I found your channel. We would like to send you this microphone that we sell on Amazon or this guitar that we sell wherever. And it'll be like, you know, a $300 condenser microphone on Amazon. And basically it's like a, it's a really good ripoff of a different microphone by a reputable company. And, you know, these businesses last for a couple of years and whatever. So they'll say basically, oh, well, let's send you the microphone. You can keep it. Um, can you do a review on it? And it's like, well, this microphone is worth $300 new. If I throw it for sale, I'll get 150 bucks for it. Maybe it's going to take me 15 hours to make the video. It actually isn't, this is actually useless to me, right? It's, it's the amount of time it's going to take to make the video, the amount of money I can make from the video, potentially the cost of the item itself. If I were to actually, you know, sell it, if I don't want it anymore, it, it ends up being like a zero. Like we broke even on everything because I did this. And so it's right. almost, it, it's very smart on the companies and right. Because they basically have to pay almost nothing for advertising because, you know, if the mic is $300 on Amazon, what does it cost them to send it? What does it cost them to give one away? Maybe 50 bucks, 60 bucks. And if someone buys one, they've already made all of their money back and then some. And, right. uh, so yeah, it's, it's, that's one reason why I personally have not done any of those reviews yet. And again, I, my plan is to be full-time YouTube one day with a mix of gear reviews and my own music and all of that stuff. And I'm still, I'm kind of right at that phase where I'm trying to figure out the, the morality of the whole thing because I can't afford to keep buying $3,000 guitars to review um, one time, which is what I've basically, you know, been doing for the most part. I mean, a few of the guitars I already had, but you know, it's not profitable to spend $2,000 per YouTube video, right? And at the same time, me personally, I, I can't not be annoyingly honest. So I, I just feel like on, on the one end, I'm happy that I found this little niche of other very, very analytical nerdy people who like to hear me rant about things positive or negative, but it's really hard to imagine how this could ever be both honest and sustainable and also right. still trigger the algorithm into proper ways to you know yeah. find people especially as a small creator you know you don't have that sort of money to throw around um yeah it's a re it's a real challenge i don't know but can i ask you a question going back to uh 
what we were talking about before and like building this niche, this niche that maybe isn't necessarily what you wanted to create. You're talking about how you wanted to teach music more than anything. And a lot of that happens through the lens of gear reviews. What's your like strategy, I guess, moving forward for the next, let's just say this year, um, on how to pivot more towards the stuff you want to create. And then I'll, I'll share mine as well afterwards. I'm curious. Yeah. So what I started, so basically I started this channel in summer of 2022 and I did a couple guitar, I did a couple like a uh, guitar lesson videos that got basically zero traction. And I always knew that I'd have to do gear reviews to get some attention, but I didn't under, I didn't think that my first gear review would go like it did. My first gear review was my Parker, my first Parker video. And that mm. immediately exploded. Like it has now like a hundred thousand views and it jumped from zero to like 50,000 in like three weeks. And that was after having only like 10, 20 views per video on some of my older videos. Wow. And my plan initially was always to have the gear reviews in the gear reviews to highlight my guitar playing. And then hopefully you hear my playing in the gear review and go, oh my God, he actually can play guitar. I wonder if he is a good guitar teacher. And then I can take you on as a private student or you can buy my courses. And that was always the plan. The thing that I underestimated was how much time it takes to make a good video and how much time that takes away from your ability to actually spend time teaching people one-to-one um, -one, or even working on yourself, your own playing and your own music. And so right. once that one video hit, I spiraled for the next five months <laughs> just trying to keep my life together long enough to make the next uh, gear review video. And um, my playing started to go down, as many guitarists will tell you, making YouTube videos. Um, oh, yeah, same. Yeah, but I did get through my first course suite that I intended to make, so that is for sale. They are not selling very well at all, I'll be honest. But I'm, I, I stand by my lessons because I do think I'm a very good teacher, if nothing else. Like, I'm a much better teacher than I am a guitar player, 100%. I embody that. I'm happy to be that person. So for 2023, what I've been trying to do is when I do get a piece of gear that I care about, my idea to keep this financially viable is to continue to buy the gear, but to spend so long with it that it balances out to not being a, a bad purchase, right? I have a Strandberg series that I'm doing. I bought one guitar for this series. Well, two guitars, one I'm returning, one I'm keeping. And I can do two months of reviews with that one instrument. And hopefully by that time, the core sales and the um, monetization will be in the green. Um, and that's what I'm basically just trying to do. Sell my lessons and have my lessons eventually be so successful that I can buy as much gear as I want and then say as much as I want without, without fear of, you know, repercussion. Oh. So, so your kind of like trajectory is trying to sort of turn uh, viewers into students, get the most out of the can with music lessons, and then have that part of your freelancing career become kind of fuel for more unbiased and more, um, uh, you know, uh, you could say higher production, uh, but uh, I guess mostly just more unbiased sort of reviews, correct? 100%. And I, I really, you know, who doesn't want to just buy $4,000 guitars all the time? I mean, that, that never, at least to me, I, I'm a huge guitar nerd. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. care about playing live. Honestly, I never was into the idea of making recorded music either. I, I, it's a beautiful thing, but it's never what drove me. I just like to practice guitar and teach and 
geek about guitar stuff. So um, I would be totally happy doing that. Uh, how it's going to work financially is still, <laughs> I don't know. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just uh, right. pray and see. That's always the question. Yeah. So for me, I, um, part of, part of the uh, benefit, I guess, of having a full-time job also is I can start to not only reinvest the money that I earn from the channel, but also subsidize it a little bit with the full-time job. So for me, um, I asked my community, okay, so, so sorry, let me back up for a second. The way I view maybe adjusting content a little bit on YouTube is technically there's nothing stopping anyone from just doing something else. Um, so for example, let's just say I, I wanted to, um, whatever, I, I'm, I don't want to just be a review channel. I'm going to make this video essay but the way i view that is if you were to just do like a 90 degree turn or a 180 degree turn a you're betraying the people that came to you for a specific kind of content niche and, and b it's just not a good idea like no one's gonna watch it you, your views are gonna tank and and the way youtube works is you know if your initial views aren't getting performance, YouTube isn't going to further recommend your older videos. So it, it actually affects your older videos too. Um, so how I'm trying to figure out how to navigate this like one degree at a time turn, the sort of like ease in to a, a new sort of content direction, which hasn't started yet. The way I'm going to do it is going back to being able to reinvest from full-time job is, I'm hiring an editor, actually. Um, I asked my community, uh, for anyone who knows Premiere, who's worked in video before, and I was able to talk to a few people, and I found like an amazing guitarist. He's better than me. Uh, he's, he's like a math rock dude uh, named Nick. And he's an amazing audio engineer. It was really important for me that anyone that was on my team is not only a really good editor, but also is a musician. So... Um, he sort of embodied everything I needed. Um, he would know what I was talking about if I started saying the frequency response in the 2K is a, a weird peak. And uh, I think the sibilance is bad. You know, like the, you couldn't just get an editor to say that. You need somebody that understands that terminology. Um, so he's helping me kind of make the regularly scheduled content. And he's helping me make it more than I would have without him. Um, so every week I'm able to put something out rather than you know, consistently for two weeks and then I'm gone for two weeks. Um, and he's been awesome. And while that's happening, I'm just going to make the stuff. Uh, so, so I'm still filming everything. I'm already still, still doing the research, the thumbnails, the titles, everything that isn't just the bare bones edit. Um, but while he's helping me out on that direction, I'm just going to make stuff I want to make, whether it's good for the channel or not. It's hopefully people will enjoy it, but I want to have this piece, you know, a few months down the line that is like, Hey, I made a film and I'm really proud of it. And this is, if I could make anything in the world, I just made it. Um, and hopefully by still kind of feeding the machine and, and giving people kind of what they want on the channel, um, and making sure YouTube is happy with the level of activity on the channel. I can remove myself a little bit, make this piece that I want to make, and hopefully it can find its own audience or the audience that I have that will enjoy it. Um, so for those who, who um, maybe aren't like in the content creator niche, it's a little bit strange how YouTube is both um, your focus group like your community is your focus group, uh, I should say. So it's going to collect data on your subscriber base. And then from that data, it will decide whether or not to send it off to new viewers. So it'll say, it'll see, um, based off of the people who regularly watch your videos, you're getting whatever, five to 10% of them are clicking on the video. That's better than normal. Of those people that watch the video, you're getting a 60% retention rate. That's better than normal. 
Um, and it takes these sort of measurements and then goes based off of the numbers that we're getting from your core audience, we'll ship it out. So my hope is that, you know, a few months down the line, I've already started working on this piece. So I can share a little bit more info about it um, if you'd like. My hope is even though maybe it's not the exact sort of video that, you know, my demographic of my community will want, it's an interesting enough concept to get those numbers where they need to be to ship it off to people that have never heard of me before, um, which is the challenge. It's like, what kind of content can I make that is like, I want to make like a mini documentary basically. Um, and I want this documentary to be good enough that the core audience likes it enough to promote it further. Um, so that's kind of like my basic strategy is make sure I have a team of really awesome people to help me out making exactly what the people want. Um, and then while I'm producing that experiment and, and make these sort of like pieces that are something I'm really proud of. Cause you know, I can produce a piece and be happy with the information I gave and think it's a good piece. But then I can also like turn around and ask myself, is that what you wanted to make? And I'm like, well, no, if you ask me in a void, it's not the exact piece of content I want to make. I still think it's a good piece of content, but it's not my passion piece. Um, so my goal is to make these passion pieces and have um, really awesome people support kind of the basic foundations of the channel. Yeah. Is this the one that you're talking about? Is it uh, music related or is it documentary? Totally. So the video I wanted to make is um, about nostalgia, actually. I wanted to do a piece about how our perception of music changes based off of um, nostalgia and also how nostalgia can be used as kind of like this production hack. Like how can we, it's really hard to explain I've tried so many times, but I always feel like without having like time to sit down and tell somebody with like 10 minutes what it'll be, it's, it's hard. But um, basically I'm making the argument that nostalgia is a byproduct of music production and how you can use very measurable techniques, production techniques to sort of force the audience into feeling sort of this feeling of a memory they never had. And I'm going to use kind of music genres, music pieces, and even internet movements that have happened uh, in, in music to kind of show how you're getting this weird feeling. Like a good example is, um, have you ever heard of this internet subgenre of music called liminal music? No, I haven't. It's it's a really weird sort of thing. It's basically ambient pieces and it's paired with media, like, like visual media of abandoned spaces. Um, and architecturally liminal spaces are basically points of transition. So a hallway would be a liminal space. A lobby of a hotel would be a liminal space. The point of that, that space is to move into a space that matters. Um, now the internet has kind of taken that definition and warped it to mean a space transitioning through time. So the internet sort of perspective on a liminal space would be a dead mall. You know, it's a product of the early two thousands or sort of the like late stage capitalism version of, you know, uh, consumerism and, you see these, th these ambient pieces paired with these like visuals of abandoned spaces. And these ambient pieces usually have a lot of sampling found sounds, uh, these uh, or low pass filtering vinyl crackle, all these sort of very measurable, very easy production techniques that when you pair them with these sort of visuals, you, you look at the comments of these sort of internet, uh, playlists or these YouTube playlists everyone is like 
super depressed <laughs> or is like talking about like their experiences in life and is or saying like this piece makes me feel something I haven't felt in years and it's it's a weird thing and it's like how can we dissect that piece and take those sort of techniques and apply them to your own piece and then also explore psychologically what's happening to you when you feel these things and how it relates to you as a childhood and then talk about for example how are the melodies using music theory to all of a sudden make you feel nostalgic? And I'm making the argument that by making these melodies that rarely move from tonic, basically, you know, they go to the second a lot, maybe they go to the fourth and the fifth, but they never leave what is a comfortable 12 tone harmonic scale. And they often harmonically are using a lot of chord inversions that always have the root close by we are essentially invoking this idea of a lullaby. Um, and in doing so, relating this kind of music to our youth. Um, and, and I'm also going into a bunch of other pieces too. And, and I'm really just trying to dissect how nostalgia warps your perception of music and you know makes you feel things, even though you never even experienced what the person who's writing about is talking about. Um, Anyways, uh, that, that's kind of the idea. And I want to make this like piece that is like really matters. And I can look back in like 20 years and be like, I made that. And I, I, I was crazy busy for three months and I published it and I'm proud of it. And to mm -hmm. me right now, like that matters to me more than, or, or at least I'm trying to make sure that matters to me more than getting one out of 10 in the YouTube studio. I'm hoping that my team with my editor can, I say team, it's just me and my editor, can make sure that part of the channel lives. And I can make sure that I'm also making content that I want to make at the same time. Um, that was a long ramble, but it's that's the basic sort of plan for me. Yeah. And my, my as soon as you, well, here's my thought. And I'm sure you've thought about this before. And so if this is totally going to ruin it, then just please say that because that's also interesting. My initial thought is sure. that, okay, well, if you start this idea, but you start it with a microphone yeah. and explain, you know, this microphone is from, I don't know, 1982 and it captures this in this way. And as a result, you feel X, Y, Z. And that's the hook. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into all of the other nether regions, right? All of the more out there stuff. Um, I'm sure you thought about that, but is that idea kind that of, cool. is that kind of ruining the idea of you doing this for yourself? I don't think it's ruining it so much as for the very first one that I make, I'm going to make it exactly how I want to make it without thinking about anyone else. And then, you know, I, I'm, I'm not naive. I'm expecting, even though this piece took so long, I'm expecting it not to perform as well. It's fine. It's mostly just me wanting to make something I want to make. But after that, recalculating from there, I do have a concept in mind for uh, an idea that is along those lines that could still be, here's my cat, could still be a, um, she wants food, it's meal time. Um, could still be like something that, you know, a microphone based audience would like and is still kind of this sort of video essay documentary style, which is um, Bonnie Bear recorded his first number one album, his first album ever, which was a number one album all on one SM57. Right. That'd be a really cool sort of like video uh, where I, I the initial audience is completely into it. Uh, and also I could explore kind of like the larger aspect of how he wrote that, you know, he, he went to an, a house in the middle of nowhere um, after I'm pretty sure a really rough time in his life. And through a lot of self-reflection ended with this piece that a lot of people resonated with, but at the same time, I could talk about these concepts is, you know, um, which is microphones. So I'll take this first video. I'll make it exactly how I want to make it. 
I'll look at what happens and then I'll take a step back and be like, all right, well, I'll do a similar concept through the, you know, theme of the channel next. Or, you know, maybe, maybe this initial piece goes really well. And then I'll go, all right, well, then I'll go more crazy. You know, I'll, I'll try another concept that's completely out there. If you guys are on board for this kind of stuff, you know, you know, a little bit of recalculation after the first kind of blind step. The interesting thing about that idea is, and I'm, I'm saying this for listeners more so than you, because you notice already, but there is a segment of YouTubers and YouTubing that is very much like video essays, very conceptual, very heady stuff. And a lot of these videos do really, really, really well. Like they reach such a wide audience because it, it captures people who are not even, who don't even care about music, microphones, guitars. It's just my girlfriend who's not a musician, right? It captures her and me and my mom and everyone else. And the video that Ricky is describing to me sounds like it has that potential. And I'm excited for you, but, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, let's hear it. The, the the tricky thing about YouTube, as Ricky knows, and as you're going to know now, is that even if you have a video that you know for a fact, so many people would enjoy if they actually saw it. That doesn't mean that YouTube is going to let them see it. That that's the tricky right. thing especially when you already have an audience that just wants you to say, this microphone has more high end frequency. This one has more low end frequency. It sounds better if you, whatever, whatever, whatever. And right. I, I have hope for, for this idea for you because I, I mean, it's interesting to me. And although in the past I've only gone to your channel to see mostly microphone stuff, mm -hmm. if, I saw that video from you, I personally will be interested. And if it had a hook, like not this next one, I understand what you're saying. You want to do this one for yourself and then explore like hooks and all of that stuff. But it, it, it sounds like a video that it's a video that I would scroll by and just go, what, what is this person talking about? Let me just see what this is. Right. You know? Yeah. That's a big challenge is like, so much of this, even though it's going to be months of work, um, so much of it is literally just going to be the, the thumbnail and the title. You know, yep. like if I can title it right, if the thumbnail's cool enough or, or disruptive enough to make somebody look, um, maybe. But I think you know, like as you said, I'm I'm making this one for myself. If it gets two thousand views, that's still cool. That two thousand people saw this thing. I like. I'm really hyped to make. Um, so, yeah, it's it's mostly just a, a piece for my own personal therapy, I suppose. Um, and then from there, I'll put on my content hat again and and figure out some sort of larger production that satiates the desires of gear people like myself. Like myself, I'm part of it, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, this conversation, I, I did not think that we were going to talk about YouTubing <laughs> for the whole time, but I'm happy <laughs> we did because now I can, I have an totally. easy, a nice, easy title for this podcast. Um, all of my other podcasts have been like very, just jump from here to there to there to there. But I feel like we, right. We've basically been talking about the business of YouTube more or less. Yeah. I mean, it, I find it fascinating and it's also fun to talk to somebody about it who like understands what I'm going through. Cause it's, it's a weirdly, like it's such a specific sort of experience, but it's also like an incredibly like emotional experience too. Yeah. You know, it's so when you find somebody who can relate, um, it's just like, it's, it's hard not to talk about. It's emotionally taxing very mostly taxing and is also incredibly solo. Like, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's, there's a weird thing that happens when you've been editing yourself for 40 hours and you start to have this, like, what, what am I is it's this weird thing that I, I don't know if anyone else could understand, but like 
you're watching yourself talking and you're editing yourself talking. And then you're thinking about the edit and about how someone else is going to watch you talk. And there are these moments where it's almost out of body and it's like, it's very strange thing that happens or when you, every once in a while, I have a separate YouTube channel that is not my YouTube channel where I just watch videos um, because I don't want everyone to know everything that I watch. Yeah, same. <laughs> and so every once in a while, my own video will pop up and it's this very strange, like, what is <laughs> yeah. the algorithm, and also, the algorithm like, like, figured thumbnails? out? Yeah, like, yeah. If anyone ever sees me posing for a thumbnail, I'm I'm done. <laughs> I'm not, it's just like you're sitting there, you're going, and then you look at the raw footage as you take a screenshot of a weird pose you're making. It's like, what is and my the weirder life? the pose, the better the thumbnail. So you gotta I'll, do it. I'll conclude by I'll conclude where we started. Ricky started by saying that you know, for a while you don't let anyone watch your videos. Yeah. My, my Instagram is still private. I have, and I don't really use Instagram, but if you wanted to get a group of my friends and family, it's on Instagram. I have still never posted anything about my YouTube stuff on Instagram or on Facebook. Like there are very few people who know, but they know as this like thing that they don't know how to find or ever see. And every once in a while, someone wow. will text me like, Oh, I saw it. I'm just like, oh God. Ugh. It's just, <laughs> I feel like you caught me watching porn if you like caught my video. It's, it's just very, <laughs> very embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I let people see, but I don't let people like, sometimes I'll share the content I make on my story, but it's usually a clip of a performance that's inside of a video. It's not like what the video is about. And I usually don't link out to the video. It's just like, Hey, look at this cool film thing I made. But yeah, I didn't show anyone for like the first five months. Oh, I think I'm like, I think I'm like month eight now. So maybe, maybe month eight with maybe 10 K. I'm not wow. August. That's impressive dude. Some somewhere around there. Um, but you have to remember that. That's I, really I, impressive, man. Uh, I planned this very, very strategically for a long time. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just say that that's really why it worked out. And, and probably has nothing to do with any of that, but whatever. Well, it's working out nonetheless. Yeah. So, all right, dude. Well, it, was, it was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, sorry, absolutely. Sorry, sorry. Continue. No, no. I was just gonna say you're local. We should, we should definitely meet up at some point. Um, Anytime, yeah. yeah chill. I, um, I'll, I'll email you my number or something if you ever wanted to grab a drink. I'm, I'm down. Yeah, cool. Oh, thanks, uh, everyone. Oh, of course. Uh, look up Ricky's channel. It's under Audio Haze, H A Z E. Do you have anything else that you'd like to uh, share with people besides your main YouTube channel? Uh, along the lines of what we were talking about, if you're watching and you see that really ambitious nostalgia video to show up in your feed click it <laughs> I guess. we're gonna we're gonna share that on my community tab when it comes out absolutely um oh, thanks man because i, I mean I, I want this to work because i feel like if you make it work then i feel like okay i, I can make my next thing work <laughs> my next random oh, strange thing so we'll, we'll try to prop each other up as we as we rise to absolutely. youtube stardom <laughs> all right cool dude yeah anytime I'll see you, man. Thanks. Bye-bye.